Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining ARC's Fireside Chat. Uh, today, we will be talking about Proposition 20, Move Our Community Forward. So it's no on 20, and let's move our community forward. Before we get into discussion and introduction of the amazing human beings that will be discussing this topic today, I'd like to give some instructions as I do every week. So if you're on the computers, please take a moment to look down at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a ribbon with multiple icons. So if you click on the chat box or the Q&A uh, box, you can literally send us questions live. And as time permits, we will answer those questions live. Okay, so, so please feel free to add questions to either the chat box or the Q&A. We prefer Q&A so we can keep a uh, tab on which ones we've already answered. Again, thank you so much for joining us this week. And I'd like to just jump right in and introduce some of our amazing guests and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. So again, today we'll be talking about Prop 20 which it seeks to roll back incredible successes that we've had in, in criminal justice reform of both Prop 47, Prop 57, and AB 109. So we have with us the incredible Tanish Hollins cap from California State, the California State Directi Director of California Survivors for Safety and Justice. We have the incredible Dan Seaman uh, from Grace Public Affairs and our very own Dominique Davis, an incredible human being a member of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Let's get right in. Uh, Tanish, uh, introduce yourself and, and, and tell us a little bit about CSSJ. Uh, take a minute or two, please. For sure, thank you for having me, Sam. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Tanish Hollins. I am the California State Director of Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, also the Associate Director of Californians for Safety and Justice. Uh, we are a, a crime survivor network on the crime survivor side of more than 12,000 uh, crime survivors, uh, mostly black and brown and from impacted communities who are coming together to push a new agenda for public safety um, that really does call for less spending and investments in the criminal justice system and more investments in prevention, uh, healing, uh, reentry services, things that are actually going to produce safety in our communities. Uh, Californians for Safety and Justice is one of the organizations that led the work around Prop 47 and 57. And so our survivor network has been a partner in that over the past seven years, using our voices and our stories to really help uh, leaders and legislators understand why we need to make those shifts. On a personal level, I'm a native of San Francisco from a community called Bayview Hunters Point. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, at the height of the crack era and saw that impact on my community, how mass incarceration and victimization really terrorized uh, and broke a lot of our relationships. Unfortunately, I lost two brothers and many other family members to gun violence. Uh, so this work is personal for me. Long before I had those losses in my family, I was committed to pulling my community together uh, and helping folks understand what we need to do to heal. Um, and where we need to be putting our attention if we want safety. So I'm honored to be here and participate in this conversation with y'all. Thank you, Tanisha. We greatly appreciate you being here and looking forward to your, you sharing your insights with, uh, with us. And we'll jump to our very own Dominique Davis. Uh, please introduce yourself. How long have you been with ARC? What are you doing right now? <clears throat> Hi, everybody. My name is Dominique Davis. Um, I've been a member of ARC for the last two and a half years. Um, I am currently a bail instructor at the Bail Project in Los Angeles, and I'm happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan, introduce yourself and tell us your history around the work of Prop 47 and 57. Sure. Um, thank you, Sam, for, for having me here today, and thank you, Dominique and Tanish, as well, um, for, for addressing this important topic. Uh, my name is Dan Seaman. I'm currently with Grace Public Affairs, um, which is running the No on 20 campaign. Uh, and I'm <coughs> recently with uh, Governor Newsom's administration and Governor Brown's administration before that, uh, advising both governors on criminal justice reform matters. And uh, prior to that, I worked in the state Senate, also working on, uh, on these issues related to criminal justice reform starting around 2008. So I've uh, I was sort of been on the inside of of institutions um, over a period of of big change uh, in this in this arena, and uh, really have been able to have been blessed to to work with some amazing people and and move the ball forward on on you know step by step brick by brick 
you know, building an, an actual justice system, something that we can, we can fairly call a justice system as opposed to what we've had uh, for the last 30 years, most of my life um, and here in California. With regard to 47 and 57, um, you know, worked directly with Governor Brown on, on passing proposition, writing and passing Proposition 57, which had a huge impact on, on the, the pre, pre-COVID, had a huge impact on the, the hope, um, you know, within prison in California and the ability of folks to, to sort of see a path forward uh, and a different path forward. Um, and this, this proposition would, would really be extremely detrimental to, to all of that progress. So thank you, I look forward to talking about it today. Um, and thanks again to, to the fellow pan- panelists. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, appreciate you being here and the work that you've been doing on, on this work on, on making our, 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 our system more equitable. Is it equitable yet? No, but we, we continue with this work and we will continue, we will not stop until it is equitable. Uh, I'd like to go directly to uh, uh, Tanish. How do you come to advocate on behalf of survivors of crime and, and incarcerated people and, and why do you stand against uh, Proposition 20? Yes, Sam. So I mentioned when I opened up, you know, my my personal experience and how I got involved as an organizer years ago was really making sure that my community's voice uh, was heard, um, you know, as these decisions around public safety were being made for our community or about our community, uh, but not including our community in the conversation. And I would say the same thing when it comes to victimization, you know, black and brown folks from our communities are not Uh, often given the compassion or the empathy or the resources or support that they deserve when they're a victim of a crime. The first question is, what did you do? You know, how did you participate uh, to cause this harm in your community or to yourself? And I experienced that, unfortunately, you know, even with all of the work that I'd done uh, when I lost both of my brothers, that scrutiny is always there. The support and the access to the support is not the trauma is long-term, the support and resources are not long-term. Um, and a lot of times uh, victims and this conversation around public safety are pitted against each other. Victim voices are usually centered um, and a lot of times used to justify the tough on crime approaches. For sure, the tough on crime approach that's uh, ran California for decades, uh, things like three strikes. There was a direct relationship between victims' voices and their stories um, and those outcomes. But the truth is that the victims from our communities, the ones that experience the higher rates of crime and victimization, their voices are never reflected in those conversations or their policy decisions. If they were, then you would hear stories like mine where you find that you know, both of my brothers had contact with the criminal justice system. They were both on probation when they lost their lives. And long before they you know, unfortunately lost their lives, they had many, many contacts with all these systems and unfortunately did not get the support that they needed. We didn't get the resources or the access that we needed to support them or support ourselves as family to deal with the consequences of them. We see this cycle play out over and over and over again in our communities. So to be, you know, in a conversation right now about Prop 20, you know, as a survivor, for most of us, for the majority of us who want long-term public safety, we already recognize that pumping more money into the criminal justice system is not gonna get us there. You know, we've already had the highest rates of incarceration in the country in California. It didn't keep any of us safer. Um, and then we talk about the investments. There was, le- in, you know, all of the decades uh, where we've invested into the criminal justice system in tough on crime, less than 1% of those resources actually came to communities um, for victim services, um, you know, for survivors to get the support that they needed. So it's important, you know, for survivors like me and others who are in our network around the country and especially here in California to be in this conversation to bring our stories so that people can understand the intersections and how, you know, moving in the direction or moving backwards um, is not going to help us achieve safety and actually it's all rooted in, you know, the racial and systemic injustices that we've been experiencing for years. It's time to, it's time to stop. And, it's, and we have to move forward in a different direction. I look, thank you so much, Tanisha. Tanisha. You just literally, I'm thinking and you said it. Systemic racism is something that we're talking about changing. Like, and Dan, you talk about brick by brick, mm-hmm. removing these issues, like the lack of compassion uh, that the criminal justice system that has afforded our, our communities that, 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 are, that are black and brown that fill these institutions. 
And if we just look at it right now, the o opioid uh, epidemic, when it was crack, it wasn't about healing or taking people and making sure they had treatment. It was locked up and we had this huge prison boom. And it was like, just, let's just continue to put these bricks in and, and build and build and build. And now here we are at a point where in the first time in 30 years in California, our prison population is below 100,000. And now you have something like Prop 20 that says, you know what, we want to make it go back up to 178,000. That's, that's how I read it. We don't want to give compassion. Prop 20 literally says we don't want to give compassion to people of color. That's how I read it. And so when we talk about changing the system and removing this, the, the system, systemic racism, this is part of it. Pushing back on legislation like this that will hurt people of color, that will hurt our communities, that, that, that are not given compassion and that are under-resourced. Dan, you spent time working in, in the California governor's office, as you said, especially on Prop 47 and 57. What does Prop 20 undo and why is it harmful? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the question here really is if you peel back the lies essentially uh, of the Yes on 20 campaign in terms of the rhetoric, and you peel it back and you actually read the, read the language of the proposition, you look at the policy behind it, it, it does not tweak or fix or slightly change recent reforms. It, it guts recent, recent reforms. It goes back even further to where we were before Prop 47 and before 57 and before 109 to a place where, you know, specifically we would have one of the lowest felony thresholds in the country uh, for petty theft, nonviolent, uh, petty theft uh, would be $250. You could have a felony consequence uh, for that. That's stealing a bike, that's stealing a, you know, a bottle of alcohol. Just for comparison, Texas and South Carolina, their, their, their thresholds are $1,500 and $2,500. So we would be completely out of whack from states that are not considered stalwart reform states. Um, it's really, really disingenuous. The, the threshold before 47 was $450. So they're going way, way beyond that. They're not fixing anything. What they want to see is a carceral response to every, every crime, every violation of, of a social norm for whatever the reason. The response should be jail, prison, probation, law enforcement supervision. That's the only solution that, that they see. And they don't see that what we've done over the past 10 years is, is actually follow research, follow science, follow experience, follow the, the voices of actual crime survivors like Tanish and actually listen to them as to what they actually want instead of using them as a, as a political pawn to say, you know, victims, you know, victims support tough on crime policies. If you actually listen, no, they support reducing, reducing victimization, which means rehabilitation, it means restorative justice, it means funding and trauma recovery. Uh, so all of these things are, 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 are not relevant to the yes on 20 side. They don't believe in them. It's an ideological uh, barrier. Um, and, you know, th these are police unions and, and prison special interests exclusively, uh, along with a couple um, misguided elected officials and, and district attorneys. Other than that, there's no support for this policy. Um, this is really just folks who, who feel that they lost something uh, through recent reforms and they want to return to a, a broken system, which, you know, we don't have to guess. We, we have 30 years of lived experience here to know how this works out. This is, uh, these are billion dollar policies with no benefit to, to communities. Uh, we had a higher crime rate. We spent more money on building prisons. We cut our education budget. We did all the things that would, that would result in less safety um, and we tried it for 30 years, so we know what we know what that what that means. I'm getting off track. You asked specifically what it would undo. 47, it would undo um, the it would reduce that felony threshold. By doing that, it would directly cut trauma recovery centers, which are funded through the Prop 47 savings. So they're actually cutting victim services uh, mm -hmm. at the same time as they're speaking out of the other side of their mouths, trying to say that that um, this is somehow helping victims. With regard to 57. It would take a list of crimes and basically remove the ability to program your way towards uh, an earlier, potentially an earlier parole hearing before the parole board. So it's not early release. Um, 57 basically just created the incentive to, uh, to, to program your way 
to an earlier hearing in some instances. This would revoke that, um, essentially saying, we don't want you to rehabilitate while you're in prison. We want you to just sit in the, sit in the cage and, 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 and be there for, for decades. And somehow when you do get out, because 95% of the folks in state prison do return to our communities, somehow that will have, will have solved the problem and will have you know, helped you figure out a way to, to move forward with your life. It's, it's, uh, it just, it doesn't meet the, the, common sense, uh, the common sense test. So they're removing credit earning, they're removing rehabilitative incentive in prison, they're incarcerating more people for low level nonviolent uh, offenses. And with regard to AB 109, they're returning us in direct uh, contradiction to what even probation chiefs, even probation professionals tell us uh, is the right way to go. They're disregarding that and they're going back to a system where basically we have three strikes and you're out uh, with regard to probation violations, no matter how minor that violation might be, whether you missed the bus and missed an appointment, whatever it might be, three times and you're going into revocation, possible rev revocation proceedings uh, through the courts. Um, so the chief probation officers oppose this. They oppose Prop 20 strongly uh, because they know that that doesn't work and that continually pulling people through that trap door of, of probation violations and, and um, for things that aren't even new crimes in most instances, um, but are technical violations is an insane waste of money and doesn't do anything to, to make our community safer. So it really goes way, way back. It takes us way back in terms of the, these, three, these three reforms, which have objectively made us safer. We have the lowest crime rate now in California, we know uh, through the data since basically we started keeping track in the 1960s. That's um, I, I literally want to put a pin right in that. You, what you just said from 2009 to 2019, California crime rates have declined across the board, across the board. Now all of a sudden we need to lock people up. Doesn't doesn't make sense to me. I don't know about you, but it doesn't make sense to me. I would think that we would want to continue to be able to give healing to our survivors and make sure that rehabilitation is robust within the system. Because the, the key to it, as we've learned, is rehabilitation. And, and uh, they're living examples. I'm one, Dominique is another. Uh, in fact, Dominique, uh, you came home to your family earlier as a result of, of reforms like Prop 57. Can you tell us more about that and why are you know on Prop 20? Sure. So first, something to help me come home to um, Proposition 47 and 57, like Dan said, it motivated us to properly program or positively program in order for us to get home. So when I heard that I could come home earlier by 50% if I went to fire camp or if I heard that I could take a transitional class and get three weeks off my time, of course I'm going to take that class in order to get home faster than my family. Of course I'm going to go somewhere where I can be closer to my family. My family was in LA and um, I was in Chowchilla but I ended up going to fire camp so I could be closer to my family and get the proper programming time. So outside of that, what I was able to get to a fire camp at CIW, get qualified for the ACP Alternative to Incarceration Program, ultimately dis discharge from the prison earlier, but go to a supportive service network at Health Right 360, where I was met with trauma support, where I was met with counseling, where I was met with parenting classes, all of these life skill classes that helped me get back on my feet after eight years of homelessness, eight years of trauma, eight years of, you know, um, addiction, you know, without the programming from 57 and 47, without the initiative, uh, without the incentives of the housing, um, through breaking barriers for the AB 109, without the um, funding for different organizations to take us AB 109 non, nonviolent offenders and the support of probation. Even as someone who went through probation for 12 years on and off again, I can tell you that after 47 and 57 came into place, probation took more of a supportive approach to my care. I was able to discharge this last time. Like I've never been able to discharge probation or parole. It's always been a real offense, but I found the support necessary for me to, um, for me to, thrive and to grow and, and i've watched you grow just just so the audience knows i've watched you uh you're doing amazing work in the community literally helping people as they come home so i, I want to give a shout out to uh my little sister uh, Don Pete, doing the work in the community uh, thank you <laughs> in this in this moment 
we have an opportunity to keep reimagining justice, uh, our justice system. Uh, why is defeating Prop 20 important? And what else do you imagine for our, for our systems? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, in order for us to really achieve safety, we have to be making the investments in the things that are going to help us heal and rebuild our communities. You know, what Dominique just shared about what she was doing, you know, in her programming, there was a lot of healing and a lot of preparation involved in all that, being closer to your family, you know, getting a, a work skill in, in training and things that are transferable, you know, when you come out on your release. And now we're, we're pushing legislation to make sure you actually get access, right? Like you actually get jobs and, you know, are able to get compensated for that type of stuff. That's important. You know, if we're not doing that, then everything is a short-term solution, right? It's a Band-Aid fix. And what we really want is we really want long-term safety. And I think there's a narrative that, especially in Black and Brown communities, that we're not interested in safety at all. Um, and, you know, again, they're, they're, that all of that, you know, racial, the racial and systemic injustice is embedded in all of that. But we have an opportunity right now, um, and not just, you know, uh, in defeating Prop 20, but you know, nationally, there's a conversation that's happening right now about racial injustice, and especially as it relates to black folks and brown folks in this country. We have an opportunity to, to reimagine all of our systems. But the one in California, you know, this, this criminal justice system, we've relied on it too much for everything. And when I think about what Prop 20, you know, what the rhetoric is and what they're proposing to do and what the money is actually behind it, is you're trying to incarcerate, or incarcerate away a problem that you haven't made a proper investment in. Mental health, uh, substance abuse, housing. We need to do a better job as a state of making sure that we have the resources so that people get what they need. And then trauma. You know, the majority of people that go into a criminal justice system have been a victim or experienced some type of trauma at some point in their lives. If we're not addressing that, then how are we actually getting to a point where we have, you know, we have a, a safety in our community? So we have an opportunity to reimagine and, and really redirect the resources so we can start getting the safety that we deserve, start building well-being, preventing things from ever happening. Like that's a real public safety approach. And so it's important. I uh, want, want to share, we had a question in the box earlier too. Thank you to these first, first and foremost. That insight is powerful. Matthew kind of says, uh, great point. So who's funding Prop 20? Uh, so I know just I, I, just to double check my facts, I went on the, the, the ballot initiative, wanted to make sure that I had the facts. $2 million of it has come from the Correctional Peace Officers Association, the CCPOA, and, and the majority of the rest has come from police unions. And so if we think in terms of why would you want to do this? Like if, if you want to strip away rehabilitative programs, if you don't want people to heal, why would you want to, you would want the best for your communities. And so when we start asking these questions and just applying logic, especially when you say again, from 2009, 2019, across the board, crime has went down. What makes you think that you, you, you need to put more people in jail? Uh, and, and, and it goes back to people are doing this because it, it, it aligns with, with benefits their pockets. Uh, quite honestly, at least in, 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 in my opinion, as I see it. Uh, and, and it also has a definite, to me, tone of racism because the people that are going into these systems are black and brown. Uh, again, I, I always go back to the old opioid epidemic because if we wanted something better, we'd say we need to treat addiction we need to find a solution to homelessness, and we need to make sure that people that have gone through trauma, violent crimes, I, uh, have a way to be able to heal. And that's where our money and our investment should, should, should actually be going to. Uh, I want to ask you uh, one other thing, uh, uh, Tanisha. Can you tell us about the work around Prop 20 with CSJ and CSSJ are doing, and uh, how does that fit in line with CSJ's overall work? Because you, you, you all do some amazing work uh, on, on a greater level. Uh, and want to just like inform our audience that's, that are listening right now. Yeah, I think, you know, our, our biggest um, role in this is education. You know, I mentioned earlier that in, um, you know, in these conversations around public safety, crime victims and, uh, you know, public safety are, you know, the crime victim voice is usually used. And in this case with Prop 20 exploited, you know, the survivor experiences are exploited 
to justify why we need these changes, right? Like why we need to take a tougher approach. Um, so the work that we're really doing is educating folks and helping them understand our survivors, folks who are formerly incarcerated, and other folks who have skin in the game. Everyone who has a vote to cast has skin in the game right now to understand, you know, where your vote matters because you're under and your understanding of what the issue is also matters, right? And understanding what how are we defining public safety? Are we defining public safety by, you know, diverting a problem to a system that we already know will fail to give us safety? Or are we talking about actually putting investments into our community that are gonna get us to where we need to be so that we, we're not experiencing crime the way that we are? Um, so I think our biggest piece is really that education, bringing survivors together, bringing uh, folks who are formerly incarcerated together, um, bringing people who work in these systems into the conversation and really, you know, listening. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, folks who have worked in the criminal justice system for decades uh, come out and say, we know this is a failed approach. Like we, we know because we've lived it, we've lived with the lessons learned. Um, and, and we know that moving in this direction is not going to give us what we need. So it's, it's the public education piece for us and really making sure the folks are well informed, um, engaged in the conversation. Thank you so much, Denise. Greatly appreciate your uh, amazing work that you all are doing. I want to share something else. So, uh, and, and don't want, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but I would like people to understand one of the things that, that this proposition says that nonviolent prisoners will be eligible for early parole consideration. Let's stop and think about what is early parole consideration. And most of the public doesn't understand you go before the Board of Parole at hearings, which is made up primarily of former law enforcement. So they're not going to just give you a free get out of jail card. You got to demonstrate that you're no longer a threat to public safety. I had to go through that process. And it's not an easy process. It's tough. So it's not like it's a get out of jail free card. You have a body, the Board of Parole Hearings, that makes this determination. And the Board of Parole Hearings are made up primarily of former law enforcement. I don't know how people cannot, or, or how this initiative does not honestly put that out there, that it's not, getting out, it's not being released early. It's literally you're going before a body of former law enforcement to determine if you're currently not a threat to public safety. So I so wanted to touch on that piece so, so that the public can better understand that this is a scare tactic. It's something uh, uh, meant, the wording, I've read the verbiage, is literally meant to scare people into voting. And uh, to be honest, like our elected representatives should not behave that way in my opinion. Uh, you should not put forth laws like this. You should be looking at making our communities united, whole, and safe. Uh, Dan, what is uh, Grace Public Affairs work around Prop uh, what is the work around the Grace Public Affairs work around Prop 20? Uh, how does that fit, fit within the larger context of, of Grace's work? Yeah, so uh, we're we're running the No campaign on on Prop 20 along with uh, along with some other folks. Um, so you know, my personal work focuses around aside from Prop 20 around other matters of of criminal justice reform. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, I, I apologize for interrupting Dan, but I know uh, Tanish has to, has to jump off at 1230 and, and want to just like really tell you, thank you for being here, sister. We appreciate you and we love and appreciate the work that you're doing and how you're representing. Uh, we stand with you, beside you always, sister. Appreciate you. Thank you, Sam. Good to see you, Dan. Dominique, it's nice to meet you. I'm a huge fan of ARC's work you know, everything you do for folks who are in custody and coming out of custody and really being on the front lines of this fight for justice for our people um, and reducing incarceration, it's important. I said yesterday in a press conference that every male member of my family has had contact with the justice system. I'm trying to make sure that my son uh, is not one of those. And it's not because we're bad people or because this is what we want. It's because of the way these systems are designed. And so I'm proud to be working with y'all to dismantle these systems and get us and our communities what we need. And anytime y'all need me, I'm here. So look forward to doing more with you. And solidarity, sister. You take care. Stay safe. Y'all take care. Uh, again, I apologize, Dan. I want to just uh, give Tanisha an uh, opportunity to uh, say farewell for the moment. And, and could you go ahead and finish, like, uh, uh, in the question again, just in case our audience missed it, uh, what is, uh, what is Grace Public Affairs work around Prop 20 and how does it fit in a larger context of Grace's work? Yeah, so, so Grace Public Affairs is a, is a public affairs firm in Sacramento. One, one uh, aspect of our work is to run the No on 20 campaign. 
uh, along with some other some other folks and in, in close uh, coordination with uh, crime survivors and Californians for safety and justice among others uh, and appreciate ARC's support as well. Uh, my, my other, you know, it fits into the broader work around criminal justice reform in the sense that, you know, if, if Prop 20 somehow passes, uh, it, it really sends, in addition to the human impact, the policy impact, and the fiscal impact, it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars of, of new prison spending uh, at a time when we're, we're taught, you know, kids aren't going to school and people are worrying about getting evicted and the pandemic rages on and it's just a, what, an interesting time to ask taxpayers to, to spend more on prisons. But aside from all that, the, the message that it would send is terrible. The message that it would send is that, you know, California's uh, criminal justice reforms are in need of, of change, in need of rollback because they've gone too far, which is a false narrative. That it's just, it's, ab it's objectively false. These have been successful, very targeted reforms. You touched on it, Sam. This is not, this is not a get out of jail free card. Prop 57 does not provide, quote, early release in any form. It, it provides earned release in some instances based on your, your ability to, pro your desire to program and to rehabilitate and to, and to change your life. It's, um, it's an incentive. And, you know, you, you mentioned the parole board, you know, the board of parole hearings has under 30% grant rate today. That's after Prop 57. That's after all of these reforms. It's not easy to get through that process, as you mentioned, as you've experienced. And to, to say this is a get out of jail free card is, is, is just not true. Um, there's no other way to put it. I, you know, today, just, just as a, so the, the LA Times editorialized against Prop 20 today in a strong editorial. And I just want to, I think it really summarizes the, the, general, the general point here. They, they said Proposition 20 is built on a package of falsehoods about critical reforms that California lawmakers and voters have wisely adopted over the last nine years. There's no other way to put it. it these are falsehoods. These are not sound arguments based in policy or experience or logic. So, you know, the, the message really would, would be detrimental to the movement nationwide if 20% if, um, if of uh, grant rate is turned into a get out of jail free card in people's minds. That's not true. People need to understand what this stuff really does. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. The process of going through the board of parole hearings, I went, just, to, just my personal experience, I went nine times. So they denied me eight times. And rightly so. I, I have no, no complaints about how many times. But when it was time for me to go and I was ready to go, I came home and I've been doing work in our community, paying taxes in our community, helping youth in our community for the past nine years. So the board literally makes sure that, they, that, that there's that layer. It's not a get out of free jail, get out of, free jail, get out of jail free card. Dominique, uh, what, what, what hope does do reforms like Prop 47 and Prop 57 give incarcerated and, and systems of all people? Like, what kind of hope does it actually give? Well, Sam, like I touched on earlier, um, prior to my incarceration, I had been homeless for eight years, sleeping on the streets, sleeping in abandoned houses, whatever I could do, sleeping in motels with no, um, with no means of help, no means of support. Prop 57 and 47 provided funding to organizations to help me get housing. They provided incentives for employer, employers to hire formerly incarcerated people and train them and give them skills through maybe the community, even through the community health worker program. You know, so it provided us career objectives other than the, the social norms. You know, it made me think about career aspirations that I would have never considered prior or without even the expungements, being able to have my record expunged and sealed, you know? And it provided a lot of hope. It provided services I never thought would be available to someone who was formerly incarcerated. Growing up, I was taught, like, once you get a record, you're going to always have a record, and it's a revolving system, you know? So once, you're, once your name's in that system, it's always going to be there. But now it's given me hope to clear my record and get back on my feet and put that behind me. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And, and again, I'm, I'm so proud of you as I've watched you do your thing in the community and help so many people. A couple of questions that have come up uh, for, for uh, Edgar Castillo, Journey have, have asked, how do we promote uh, more on, uh, on Prop 20? So, so here's something that 
many people don't, Dan will share more. And here's something that many people don't realize. Most people have at least five to 600 friends on Facebook. Go on Facebook and say no on 20 and explain why. Like share, like go live on Facebook, post on Facebook, post on Instagram, ask your friends' friends to do this. Because if we really like, we've been in the streets marching and we've been asking for a fair system. We've been asking for justice. Okay, we've done it. We've got the attention. The world is center. You're right. We need to change this. Now we need to galvanize people. So on November 3rd or before, vote. Vote no on 20. Like put it out there. Share with your friends. Share with your, your, your cousins, your homeboys, your, whoever it is. Share with them and tell them this is the reason why. We want to continue to have a system that's, 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 that's becoming more equitable. If we want to continue to decrease the number of people that are in prison and make our communities whole and safer, we need to vote. The marching part was one part. The second part, a call to action right now, make sure that people vote for this piece of legislation, vote against this piece of legis legislation. No on 20. Uh, Dan, do you have ideas in terms of how we get this out even and broader in, in the community? Yeah, I think, you, I think you just said it, Sam. I mean, it's in terms of, of uh, amplifying the no on 20 message, telling your friends, telling your family, posting on, on social media, that's all helpful voting as soon as possible uh don't don't wait till november 3rd if you don't have to and and uh one of the issues you know california uh is notorious for having a really long ballot there's there's a lot of propositions there's a lot of local races people want to vote for president and you may have friends and family who who vote um but it's important that they make it all the way down the ballot so that's a that's a big thing in terms of uh even your friends and family who you think, oh, they're cool, they vote every, you know, they vote every time, they're gonna vote for Biden or vote for president or vote for this race or that race. Still reminding them, hey, you know, don't forget about 20. This is really important. You have to get down there and vote no, because as people drop off, you know, they, we, we, could, we could be winning in, in, in an overall sense, but if people don't actually make it down the ballot and check that no box, you know, they, they could, uh, the other side could squeeze out a victory. So it's really important to, to like you said, just use your use whatever avenues you have in terms of social media, emailing, texting, or just talking to your your friends and family about um, you know remembering to vote on these propositions and and specifically no on twenty. Absolutely. So so again, whatever means you have, whether it's Facebook Live, Instagram, tele, telephone, uh, carrier pigeon, uh, whatever you be, whatever you whatever means, inform your friends and family to vote no. On, on Prop 20. The other thing, I want to actually point out something else that, that you said, Dan. Most people are, are focused on the presidential election, which is, of course, that's, that's an important election too. But understand also that you have a number of, of propositions that are on the ballot and other people that will be, uh, that are running for office that need to be voted on. Be informed, take time, do the research and answer all of uh, all, uh, the, the questions, yes, no, and who are you voting for? On the state level, there's impact for your everyday life. On the local level, meaning county or city, there's direct impact, your school boards, your district attorneys, uh, all of these things, your sheriff is an elected official. So all of these are, are, are people that you can vote for or vote against. But you have to be informed and you have to vote. And when people say that they're not voting, literally what you're saying is that I don't, have, I don't want a voice. I don't want to be heard. Your voice is, your vote is your voice in this instance. Dominique, in this time of uh, reimagining uh, how, how a system can treat people, uh, what do you imagine? Like, how can we make our system better? Or, or like, in your imagination, what do you see? In my imagination, I see more care through mental health, holistic healing. I see long-term housing for people who are homeless or experiencing a housing crisis. I see, mental, uh, I see addiction treatment in the community. I see family reunification for families experiencing any form of um, the institution, whether it be from, mat, uh, from incarceration or foster care or juvenile hall, any of it. I see a reform in our education system, you know, um, tailored to teach our kids their rights so that they don't have to fall victim of accepting things that they didn't do or what they're accused of when they didn't do it or how to fight, you know, at trial, all of that. Like, so yeah, that's what I see. <laughs> Thank you, Dominique. 
Uh, Dan, who would you say uh, benefits from a yes on Prop 20? No one, really. Um, even the people who are proposing it and think, you know, in their minds that this will somehow, you know, change things for the better or improve, you know, for, uh, improve things from, from their perspective, um, it really won't. We already know this. We don't have to, we, like I said earlier, we don't have to guess. The outcomes that they think will come about, uh, come about because of this proposition will not come about. There will not be more public safety, which is what they're arguing for. There will be not, there will not be more services or, or respect for victims of crime, which is what they're arguing for. Um, th those things will not happen. There will be less safety and there will be less services for victims of crime. And we know this because we've lived it my entire life and, and most of the last three decades. Um, so I would argue that even, even the folks who think this might get them somewhere, they're, it's not going to. They might, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's really a, an ideological barrier that, that needs to be broken uh, by defeating Prop 20 so that we can move forward. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Like I say, the probation chiefs are working with us on No on 20. You know, we can, we can get stuff done together. We can, we can get bricks Brick, bricks on top of bricks together in terms of building a new system. And uh, in order to do that, we're gonna have to, be, we're gonna have to beat this thing. We have to defeat 20 um, because if, if this passes, they, that, that worldview will get a new, a new lease on life uh, when it really shouldn't. By any measure, any objective measure, it has failed and it has failed everyone involved. You know, uh, Sam, I know you, you and I have, have talked about this in the past, but you know, correctional officers have a have one of the lowest life expectancies uh, and highest suicide rates of any profession. Who, how, how is the current system serving them? It's not. It's a, it's it's really not. And I think uh, you know we have to get beyond this proposition to get to a point where you know folks, even who work within these systems, uh, can see a different way of doing things that actually uh, that actually improves both individual lives and, and, and our, uh, our overall approach to justice. And I want to thank you for that, Dan. I want to also share, so, so literally in terms of, so uh, the nonpartisan uh, legislative analyst says that Proposition 20 will cost tens of millions of dollars, which will require cuts in programs. And those cuts will be rehabilitative programs. Those same type of programs that help people actually change how they think how they approach life and actually make our correctional system safer, not just for the people that are in custody, but for the correctional officers and staff that are there. So college programs in prisons make it safer for both the staff and the people that are in custody. Anger management pro programs that are there make it safer for both staff, correctional officers, and people that are in custody. All of the rehabilitative programs that prepare a person to come home and not recidivate make it a safer environment for both the officers and the people in custody. Why would we strip away the ability for a person to be able to become the best version of themselves so when they come home, they never go back inside a prison, unless they're in a suit like the Hope and Redemption team does. But like literally when we think in terms of, this is gonna cost tens of millions of dollars. And that's not, that's not from Sam, that's literally from the, the nonpartisan legislative analysts. And that tens of millions of dollars will not only knock out rehabilitative programming, but it will also take away from mental health programs like the one Dominique talked about that are in the community helping people heal. These are realized savings, for, savings that have been realized uh, from Prop 47, money that's going into the community to help people heal from trauma, help survivors of crime heal from trauma that they've experienced. Why would we take that from them in order to warehouse people again, something that we know does not work? does not work at all, does not help the community, does not help anyone. Oh, I was just, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's, really, uh, it's really terrible timing to put forward this kind of new spending. We, you know, Governor Newsom announced uh, in this year's budget that the state of California for the first time in my lifetime, and, uh, and, and anyone I can remember who's worked on these issues is gonna be closing two state prisons at a savings of multiple hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars uh, that can be reinvested in, in other purposes, including education and, and, and crime survivor services and mental health and, and all the things that, we, that we've been talking about today. Um, that's happening, you know, we, th that announcement is out there. 
they they are closing a prison and they're gonna they're gonna keep going down that path and you know to to write at that very cusp of seeing these reforms work uh, over years of work and years of effort from from folks in the community from elected officials from everyone right at that moment where we're going to realize those savings put those dollars back into programs that we need they're asking us to put tens of millions more back into incarceration uh, so it's it, it couldn't come at a worse time and it, and it does not make sense if you want to look at it without a policy lens or without a you know a, 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 a any kind of humanistic lens just look at it at dollars and cents this is this is a bad investment it's not good use of money uh, and and it's coming out at a time when we're about to have you know real savings in the system that we can put back into making sure people don't end up uh, affected by these systems in the first place thank you Dan uh, and so uh, we had a question which prisons uh, are they closing? So I do know that the governor announced that DVI, dual vocational uh, facility, uh, Tracy in Tracy, California, will be the first one closed. Uh, I'm not certain uh, if a second has been selected, but the announcement was that in the next year, DVI will be closed. Uh, and it cost, DVI was built in 1953. Uh, it cost $180 million to run that institution uh, uh, in, in normal circumstances, and, and that's what the, the budget is, and, and oftentimes that budget goes up over. And so we do know that that was in the press press uh, release uh, a week or so ago. Uh, both Dominique and Dan, I have a question for you. So how does uh, how does known Prop 20 fit within the larger context of the awakening uh, in our country around racial justice? Uh, Dominique and then uh, Dan. Well, I feel like uh, known Prop 20 it helps us by keeping us from going backwards we're going back because if we vote if sorry uh it keeps us from going backwards basically like like dan said earlier there was a three strikes law not too long ago under the bill clinton administration i believe that grossly took away so many people from our communities men women children and negatively impacted our community forever plenty of us know loved ones still sitting in jail right now three strikes law for small for petty crimes after maybe a a, a major one you know but there's no rehabilitation for those type of people and now they're threatening our funding and threatening how um we're trying to piece back together our communities in the black and brown community um black and brown neighborhoods so i think it'd just be detrimental if we don't vote no on 20. it would be detrimental if we don't uh damn uh how, how does how does a no on prop 20 fit within the larger context of the awakening in our country around racial justice yeah, I mean, I, I, the way I see this is the yes on Prop 20 is sort of the last gasp, a tough on crime policy era in California. And they're, they're really trying to sneak one more in here. And it's coming at a time when people are, communities of color have, have known this for, for forever, as long as this country has existed, but it's coming at a time when everyone in our society is, is literally marching in the streets asking for systemic change and uh you know uh, the time that you're they're asking voters to to directly contradict what is being asked for by the people um so really a no on 20 vote will put the put the final put the the period on the sentence in terms of our the the three strikes era the tough on crime 90s all the enhancements and sentencing laws Prop 21, juvenile juvenile justice, and 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 um, and the incarceration of youth, it will put a period on that sentence and will allow us to continue turning the, the page forward to actually proactively make the change that that everyone is asking for right now today and has been um, has been this entire year. Um, so it's really it's it's part and parcel to to that to that movement, um, and it's important to it's an important piece of that. There are other pieces. Um, that are equally important or more, um, but this is a critical critical piece to that to that effort. So, so, and, and I'd like to add in, in California specifically, and, and in comparison to to the rest of the nation, California had the third biggest prison uh, population, second only to Texas and Florida, and now that's moving down. The fourth biggest would have been, I believe, uh, uh, Georgia. And so, when we look at it in terms of decreasing the number of people that that, that are incarcerated giving uh, people that are incarcerated rehabilitative programming, preparing them to re-enter society, and, and providing resources so that they never return back. What we have is a, is a society that's better, a society that's more whole. 
and, a, and, a, and communities that are safer. And I say that from the prism of a person that spent 24 years in prison and that gives back to my community every single day. Dominique does the same thing. And we're not unique. There are thousands of others just like us. The story is just not being seen and amplified the way it should be. When people come home after having the opportunity to change and, and, and never go back. Let's take a look at those people. I would love to see uh, 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 Mr. Cooper and, and, and uh, some of the police unions and the CCPOA uh, how about we have a conversation about the over 10,000 lifers that have been released in a less than 1% recidivism rate? How about we talk about, about those facts? How about we talk about the job that the board does and how difficult it is for a person to be released? And when they are released, that, again, less than 1% recidivism. Uh, when we look at those things, let's have a, a real conversation and let's not uh, try to scare our public in a, in a, a voting on, on legislation that, that does more harm than good. I would love to see that. We're, we're about to go into our closing, so I'd like to ask Dan, closing thoughts uh, for our audience. Again, thank you for, for, for being here and uh, share some closing thoughts for our audience as we move out. Yeah, thank, thank you again for, for hosting this, Sam. You know, there's, there's a lot on people's plate right now. Uh, we're living through extremely difficult times. There's a lot on your ballot. There's a lot you're dealing th with in your, in, your, in your personal life. You know, but at the end of the day, it, it's important to remember that these, these, each small thing on your, on your ballot line, there's 10 different propositions. There's a district attorney race, a sheriff race, Congress, legislature, president. Each one of those things it has a direct impact on how our society is run. And you have that power to actually make your, as you referenced earlier, make your voice heard in those decisions. This is a really important one making sure that we turn the page on our on our uh on our our failed policies here in the state uh and move forward to a to a more restorative justice and a, and a more complete justice and a more um, equitable system is extremely important uh, you mentioned we had the the third highest incarceration rate in the country i'd be remiss if if i don't remind everyone you know watching that that puts us in in at the very top of the planet planet earth globally and historically we have incarcerated more people in the state of california for longer periods of time than almost anywhere else on earth in in human history uh and it's it's hard to it's weird to think about it in those terms but it's true and we have we've really we've we've done the hard work as a community you all have have done the hard work you know within um within prisons and and afterwards to make sure that that um, the voices of, of formerly incarcerated individuals are heard in these discussions. Now it's time for everybody to make their voice heard and, and just make it down that ballot and, and vote no on 20. Vote no on 20. Uh, Dominique, before you give, then, and before you give your last comment, I want to share something. I don't know if you see the Q&A, but there's a, a message for you that says, thank you, Dominique, for all your inner work and growth to advocate for, peop advocate for people to have a chance in life. You are a living example of positive change and healing. Long-term safety and healing are necessary. Systemic and economic racism fill these crimes of poverty continue to feed the divisions of our society. I believe when people are given mental and emotional support they need, they, need, they can work through their trauma. Scientifically, oppressed and bullied brains are different. I believe in positive programs can change lives and heal people. Life skills and training allow people to be fully valued and integrated beings. Compassion for the trauma suffered is key. What are ways we, we, uh, what are ways we develop protection in society for those vulnerable populations before they fall victims to the prison system? So that's a shout out to you. Just, just so you know, you might not have seen it, I want you to, to uh, see that. And want you to share your last thoughts for our audience. Okay, so um, in closing, thank you for that. Thank you for the shout out. Um, I just want to say this proposition is not, uh, it's not just going to affect us. It's going to really affect our kids. It's going to affect our cousins. It's going to affect our family members. Um, I wasn't old enough to um, be around for the three strikes law like that. But I do remember seeing a lot of people go to jail. I remember growing up and like, it seemed like someone went to jail almost every day that I knew in my community, like on my block. And um, I just want to urge you to invest in your community and divest in the scare tactics of the prison industrial complex and just how they terrorize our communities. You know, like, like, like Dan said, we've been marching like all these months, you know, um, we don't want to go backwards, you know, so 
Tell your uh, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your community, tell your groups. No on Proposition Twenty. Okay, so so you got a fan club, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, do you know, do you, wait, do, do you know Rick? Do you know, you know Rick Cantor? I love Rick. Hi, Rick. So Hi, he, John. I love you, John. <laughs> he, says, he says I just joined because I'm in the UK, but I'm so proud of my mentee, Dominique. Oh, thank you. I love my mentor, Rick. So, so we're about to close out my last thoughts for our audience. Please register to vote and then vote. If you want to make a difference, register to vote. Talk to your family, talk to your friends, tell them to register and then vote. Literally take time. This video will be posted on our YouTube channel. Share it with friends. It's informative. Let people understand and know uh, the power of their voice, which is their vote and then make sure that they register. Registering the vote is very, very simple. Next week, we will uh, highlight all of the propositions and we will also walk through, if you're not registered to vote, we will walk you through registering the vote. Register the vote and then vote. Remember, your voice is your vote. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you. Uh, amazing uh, human beings doing incredible work. Uh, Tanish, thank you for joining. I know you had to leave early, but thank you. Uh, and remember, the fight that we're in is, as Dominique said, a fight for our children and our grandchildren too, is to make our system and our communities better. And it's our job to do that. Thank you so much. Take care, stay safe, and God bless.